that. Okay. Okay. So let's go ahead and call to order this meeting of the Future Oriented Approach to Residential Development Task Force. Um, so Cami is going to walk us through our new uh, roll call procedure. And uh, yes, Cami, please. Thank you, Mark. Um, so it, it's been just kind of a little bit confusing when I do the minutes, just because we're on video and we don't, we haven't really been saying our names and who's there um, and whatnot. And I know some of us um, don't always have our video on or we're sharing. So it's been kind of hard for me to, to do the minutes and do in attendance and, and whatnot. So I know it's kind of been a little back and forth the last couple of months. So um, we uh, are gonna start doing a roll call attendance at the beginning. So when Bart calls me to order, he'll have, he'll announce everybody's name. And if you'll just respond with a present, then I can mark, you know, and it's also stated for the record as well, but I can mark that you are there and I know that you are. And um, I'll reflect it in the minutes. And then also when we call a motion, um, Bart will, we'll call the motion like we usually do, but then Bart will say, um, I'm just gonna, Peggy, I'll just use you for an example. You know, Peggy, we have a motion by Peggy, seconded by, you know, Yvonne or, or whoever it is. And then all, you know, all opposed or all approved, and we'll kind of carry it through that way. That way it's at least stated on the record who the motion was made by and then who it was seconded by via video versus just the minutes. Um, sometimes it's hard to catch who said it on the screen when it, because it lights up when you talk. So sometimes it's hard if we continue talking, you know, as soon as we call the motion. So um, I just want to make sure that I'm getting them right and correct each time. And then um, also I was just wanting to remind, um, it's in the bylaws it states that the voting members are though are only the, are the only members who can vote and that the alternate members are actually non-voting members but obviously they're very welcome to discuss and talk and, and make comments and stuff about the meeting and they're there to help and um and just just like you all are but when it comes to an actual vote vote their vote does not count in, unless a quorum is not present and then they are acting as the the voting member to meet the quorum if that makes sense um, it, it's actually outlined in the, the bylaws, pretty simply stated and pretty easy um, to understand too. So if there's any questions or anything, I can send those to you guys so you understand um, too. But that's really it. Are there any questions? Okay. So my, my only question is, so when we, when we do go to a vote, so let's say I make a motion to do something, can the second, the person who seconds it be an alternate or do they have no. to be? They have to be a regular voting member. Unless a quorum is not present, then an alternate. We would establish that, okay, um, I'm, Commissioner, I'm just gonna use you because you're you're the only alternate here tonight. Um, we established at the beginning of the meeting that, you know, although Kamesh is in an alternate position, he's gonna be acting as a voting member so that we meet a quorum tonight. So at least it's stated for the record, and then we'll continue as normal and then Kamesh could be a voting member. Okay, great. So shall we take our, our first stab at a roll call? Go for it, Bart. All right. Uh, Bart McElroy, present. Peggy Quinn. Present. Maria Bocalandro. Present. Uh, Russell Cowdery, not present. Uh, Sheila Maness. Present. Daniel Mirabal, not present. Yvonne Silva. Present. Uh, Kamesh Subaru. Present. I killed that, didn't I? Uh, Subu Venkat. Not present. Okay. All right. Thank you for walking us through that, Cami. Appreciate it. Uh, do we have anyone in the magic boxes for citizens' appearance? I do not see anyone. Okay. In that case, moving on to agenda item number three. Uh, consider approval of the March 10, 2021 Ford Task Force meeting minutes. Those were attached to our minutes for today. Uh, has everyone had a chance to review those and uh, uh, advise if there's any changes that need to be made? I um, I, I did review them. I mean, they're correct, um, but Kamesh seconded my motion and I thought that it'd be okay because I thought he was filling in for Daniel who wasn't there. So I thought that that would be okay. 
Yeah. So from that perspective, because we did vote unanimously to approve the minutes last time. Uh, so do we need to... But we Danielle to was uh, yesterday. Uh, last last time Danielle was present. Okay. Was on the minute. Okay. All right. So in that case, uh, Mindy or Cammie, can you think of anything we need to do to, to correct that? Or is it not and, much of an issue? And, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think because everybody motioned to approve and there was none, that it's okay to carry forward. And now okay. we just know in the future. So, and it's not any, I mean, we were unsure as this unfolds as well. This whole virtual thing is very new. So um, we're just ironing out keys as we go along. So we appreciate your patience with us as well. Just FYI, sure. sorry. Uh, much easier to tell who's saying something when you're all in one room versus yes. you know, this is inherently <laughs> potentially a problem. Okay. And in Great. that case, I'll move to approve the minutes as as they are. I didn't see anything that wasn't. Okay. Uh, Maria seconds it. Okay. So we have a motion to approve uh, the March 10 minutes uh, made by Peggy and seconded by Maria. Uh, all in favor? I guess if we, you could show your hands on the video, you know, all in favor? Yay? Okay, Yvonne, are you good? All opposed? Oh, Yvonne did the, the cartoon hands up. Good. Any opposed? All right, none opposed. All right, so motion is unanimous. Thank you. All right, agenda item number four, uh, presentation and discussion of report to city council. Uh, so this is our, our new run through. Do you, do you want me to kind of, I sent out an email, but do you want me to kind of walk through the- Yeah, if you could remind us all of the of the scenario. Okay. So as you remember, we were scheduled to go to um, council at the second meeting in March. We actually were asked to, if we would bump that to a later meeting because the agenda was fairly full and it was, it, it, they were items that they needed to cover. So. Um, but in our discussion, my, in my discussion with the city manager's office, I was kind of talking through what the presentation was going to be. And they really, they recommended that we pause and take a step back. And they said, you have to remember, we've been talking about these things for quite some time now. Council's never heard any of this information. So to go in, present all the information, make recommendations and ask them to approve them, it, it, it isn't really fair yet because they hadn't had time to hear the information, digest it, and then decide whether they agreed with the recommendations or not. So um, they said, why don't you take a step back, really cover at a high level the things that you have studied, and and then after they hear that, and I've, I've recommended to Bart and Peggy that we, whenever we present to council, that we leave some type of handout for them also so that that way and we can send it to them in advance. We can put it as part of the packet in advance of the city council meeting. But so that way they have something to walk away and still review before we go in and start talking about any kind of recommendations um, on on housing types, on incentives, on anything. And so um, so that's after after I met with the city manager's office, I talked to Bart and Peggy and just told them um, kind of to let's regroup and let's rethink this. So I haven't seen this yet, but I think that's what Bart and Peggy did. And currently we're scheduled to go to the April 27th city council meeting and work session, unless tonight you all decide that you're not ready to go on April 27th. Um, but that gives us time to go ahead and put the other thing that we talked about, we hate to have a council that's about to change vote on recommendations so we think it's best for us to be able to present it to them and then go to a, the new sitting council for um, any approvals for recommendations so we talked about that potentially at our joint meeting that that might be a good opportunity to really talk about um, recommendations and have a more um, more of a conversation than a presentation to to kind of have that so so that's where we left it, and I know Bart and Peggy were um, going to work on it from there. So with that, I'll turn it over to them. But if y'all have any questions about that, about regrouping and what we're doing, um, certainly let me know. But if you don't, then I'll let them go ahead. Okay, 
Well, let's go ahead and get into the presentation. So this is, again, the idea is that I'm giving a, a recap of what we've done since we got started as a, as a, a board and uh, just really trying to give them a, an overview of, of everything we've looked at. And also something we talked about, uh, you know, as, as brief as possible. So we, we keep their interest. Uh, we don't, we don't lose anyone's attention. So I'm going to try to keep this to around 10 minutes or so just in the interest of, uh, I want the council to, you know, be impressed with all that we've looked at and, you know, also not walk away too sleepy. So that's, uh, that's the goal. Okay. So this is our uh, progress report to the city council. So uh, getting started, I would say, hi, I'm Bart McElroy. I'm the chairman of the Future Oriented Approach to Residential Development Board. We've been uh, working since January of 2020. Uh, and we are excited to let the city council know uh, how things have been going and what we're looking forward to doing. So next slide, please. So we first met in January 2020. And our responsibility falls under the pillars of the Bold Vision 2040 plan. Uh, we were specifically directed by the city council to focus in our first year on uh, senior housing or housing for those 55 and older. Uh, during the course of our research, we focused on 11, 11 different senior living scenarios. And also we, we, we worked on determining uh, the criteria for how each of them might fit into our, uh, our city of Coppell. As part of this research, we did a great amount of research on the current demographics of the city of Coppell. And it's important to note just where we're standing now so we know uh, how to evaluate where we're going. First of all, uh, our city's population at the moment is currently, we approximate 25% are 55 years of age or older. And out of 10,580 residential properties in the city, uh, 1,910 of those, approximately 18%, have the 65 and older tax exemptions. We've also noted neighborhoods, and we'll show you a map in a bit. We've noted neighborhoods where there are uh, residents that are definitely aging in place, uh, which is one of the uh, 2040 uh, goals. So let's move to the next slide, please. All right, so this shows subdivisions and the percentage of homeowners in each that have the 65 and up uh, county tax exemption. So you can see there are several neighborhoods where you have greater than 30% of the residences that have filed this exemption. So these are neighborhoods where you can confidently say the residents are aging in place. Uh, and there are other, you know, many more neighborhoods where between 20 and 30% of the population have, uh, have filed for that exemption as well. So this is, uh, this is definitely pointing us to a scenario where uh, citizens in Coppell are, are staying here as they get older and, and seem to want to continue to stay here. Uh, next slide, please. When we look at the current landscape of uh, senior, uh, senior outreach and, and focus by the city, uh, we note that there is a water and sewage discount for those 65 and older of 10%. Uh, there's a city tax credit um, that's applied at the, at the county level, uh, value reduction of $78,000 for the 65 and above. We, of course, have the Great Senior Citizen Center here in Coppell uh, for those 50 and over. This provides social interaction as well as uh, educational programs. Some things, however, are missing in our city that are, that are available in other locations. Uh, for example, uh, outreach for shut-ins. Uh, advocacy initiatives, so assistance with home maintenance, senior services, uh, also small home maintenance options. So someone to help you change uh, the batteries and the smoke alarms, uh, to help you change light bulbs so you don't have to get up on a, on a ladder, uh, hanging wind chimes, Th these little things that can be uh, perilous for someone, uh, you know, the older they get, but also can be uh, simple for someone else to take care of. So uh, that's worth noting. Also a, a senior transportation option, and that's, uh, that's, a growing, uh, that's a growing field as well. Uh, this can be comprised of a uh, rideshare companies as well as of just local volunteers. And there's also the technical assistance, uh, computers, iPads, printers, any other technology. Uh, it's possible that there's a, a, a resident that needs assistance with that. Uh, 
Next slide, please. So these are the general uh, property approaches to senior housing that we looked at. We'll get into those in a minute. It's important to note that these are a mix of types that involve different choices. Some involve purely personal choice, like aging in place. Some involve choices that would require uh, city support or that would require uh, corporate support. That is that a, uh, a corporation, a developer would come in and have to create this sort of option. And some of these obviously fall into multiple categories. Uh, some of the options evolve one category plus a city supported choice. So we'll, uh, we'll get into that here moving forward as we talk about each of these options. Uh, next slide, please. All right, first we have the village concept. Uh, for a village, picture a gated community without the gate. Uh, and that's the idea behind a village. There's over 250 of these in the United States currently. It's built on the idea that uh, people working together are stronger and will successfully navigate the transitions of growing older. There's a real focus on peer-to-peer -peer networking, promoting active lifestyles, improving health, and reducing isolation. Uh, next slide, please. Mixed communities are communities that are, are planned developments uh, where you have a variety of housing types. So this could be a development that involves single family homes. Perhaps there's a 55 and older active adult section. Uh, you can have also increasing density in these as well, duplexes, townhomes, uh, apartments even. And in a uh, how this relates to senior housing is that typically when a developer is putting together a, a large uh, mixed use development of this type, uh, developers would be requested and or required by the city as part of the uh, permitting process to use a percentage of that land for 55 and older uh, homeowners, uh, areas for uh, mixed, mixed income housing, and as well as having uh, mixed types of housing. So you could have uh, townhouses alongside traditional detached single family. Next slide, please. Co-housing is a concept where you have a house that shares common areas like kitchens, living rooms, outdoor areas, et cetera, among multiple households. So you have individual uh, apartments with living areas or houses with living areas, but those are then centered around a uh, common areas for kitchen, dining, living room, and outdoor common areas as well. So this would be something that a developer uh, would, would build and because it requires specialized uh, floor plans and designs. But uh, the idea is this could, uh, a developer would propose this plan uh, or the homeowners could themselves form a, a, a legal entity that could build the, a co-housing uh, co -housing building. Uh, the benefit of this sort of housing is you have connected relationships by having this, this area of common kitchen, dining, and living rooms. It requires a smaller footprint overall. You're not duplicating a lot of these functions. Uh, maybe kind of along the, the idea of, of ride sharing where, um, you know, people only use their cars a certain number of minutes or hours a day. Uh, I, I certainly know I don't use my kitchen, uh, you know, more than say an hour a day. So that's, that's kind of excess, you know, I'm underutilizing that, that space. Um, these can also be set up as private homes. So this is not necessarily uh, people think, you know, co-housing, they might think of, you know, an apartment complex or something similar to that, for example. But these can be uh, set up as, as private homes. Uh, and ample common spaces, maybe more so than people would have in their individual single family homes. Uh, participation is a big, uh, a big item uh, because this uh, allows for people to work with each other towards a, a common goal and uh, shared values as well. So the people that would gravitate towards a co-housing environment are, are, are people who naturally want to be around other people, work together, and uh, you know, explore those, that kind of shared community. Uh, next slide, please. So there are some specific 55 and above housing developments out on the market. Uh, these can be either uh, single family detached, they up all the way up to high rise apartment buildings. And uh, but the idea behind them is that they're conducive to age, aging in place, uh, often built as part of a master community with other amenities for 
active adults. So in a housing development like this, you would uh, frequently have an on-site director of activities that would plan a, a constant slate of activities for people in the community to uh, participate in. And these can be things like that are sports related. They could be uh, explorations of hobbies. These could be uh, trips, any number of things. Uh, but the idea is to keep the members of this community uh, active and engaged. And uh, communities like this often have on-site amenities like golf courses, tennis courts, fitness centers, swimming pools, so on and so forth. Next slide, please. Housing cooperatives are uh, for, uh, housing cooperative is a form of ownership uh, involving um, uh, it's membership based. So this can be anything from single family houses uh, up to a building that looks like an apartment, uh, but they are jointly owned uh, by the cooperative association and they are managed by this association as well. Uh, member owned is the typical uh, process for this, but they can also be government owned or owned by a nonprofit. They can also be set up to where they're restricted to those who are 55 and up. Um, the idea behind this cooperation is that it is membership based. When you buy a unit in a cooperative, you're not actually buying a unit, you are uh, buying uh, a share in the cooperative association, and then you are granted the right to occupy one unit in that, uh, in that co-op. Uh, Co-ops aren't as common in Texas, but they're becoming more common. They're much more common in places on the east and west coast where housing prices uh, tend to be much higher. The primary advantage of a housing cooperative is you're pooling members' resources, uh, leverage in you know maintenance, leverage in you know buying electric plans for the building, um, and also this is uh, not unlike the co-housing scenario. Um, well. Unlike the co-housing scenario, everyone in a housing cooperative has separate distinct units. So everyone has a living room, kitchen, so on and so forth. But in a cooperative, uh, it's very common also for the members to um, provide services towards the upkeep and, and maintenance of the cooperative. So uh, the group could together decide to you know, hire a contractor to do the lawn care, but they could just as easily also have the members of the cooperative taking care of the, the lawns as well. So this is another aspect of the community building that you see in some of these housing types. Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, life plan communities, continuing care communities, and long-term care facilities. Uh, th this is housing. It can, it can take the form of cottages or apartments or you know, separate rooms. Uh, but it's part of a community uh, with uh, independent living houses, apartments, assisted living facilities, uh, memory care, and nursing home care. Uh, the idea is it's a, a kind of continuous uh, care community that allows you to initially live as independently as possible as you can. And as you need more care as time goes on, then that community is able to provide that care. You're able to add those additional services on as you need them. Uh, amenities that can be uh, included in communities like this include uh, transportation, um, especially uh, you know, running to the grocery or errand or doctor's visits. And also uh, amenities can include additional daily caregivers as needed. Uh, having done a, a survey of Coppell and the surrounding areas, uh, there are 59 of these facilities in the, in the cities that are surrounding Coppell. So this is definitely one of the more uh, common uh, senior housing types that we see around here uh, and in, in our surrounding area. Next slide, please. Aging in place. This is one of the, the 2040 vision pillars. Um, the ability to live in your home as someone who's 55 and older, safely, independently, and comfortably, regardless of age or your ability level. Now, in order for, in order for that to be uh, a reality for some people, the home may need modifications. They may, may need amenities like uh, rails installed in the bathroom, uh, opening up walls to make it easier to move from one room to another. Um, you might need to install a ramp to get up into the, into the, into the house. Uh, you might need technology that would allow uh, others to monitor your activity or your need for help. There are things cities can do to make aging in place uh, easier and more amenable for their citizens. This includes uh, providing aging services, 
uh, discounts as well as tax breaks. So I will mention more of that later. Next slide, please. There's a form of aging in place that uh, is called a naturally occurring retirement community or NORC. This is a neighborhood or location where homeowners decide to age in place. So aging in place is a, is a single person's or family's decision. But when you have a lot of people doing that in the same area, you have a NORC, a naturally occurring retirement community. Uh, working together, uh, neighbors can form a network of shared support services to stay in their home comfortably and safely. Uh, hence, this is not something that's created by the outside. This is a naturally occurring community. Uh, as noted before, Coppell has some pockets that exhibit uh, properties similar to a, a naturally occurring, re occurring retirement community, but to the best of our knowledge, they have not formed, uh, they've not yet formed networks of shared support services. Next slide, please. Uh, so the granny pod, uh, also known as, uh, I've heard them referred to as laneway houses, uh, pied a terre, uh, mother-in-law cottages, a lot of ways of looking at this. But this is a, a tiny house, usually around 500 square feet, built on a large lot behind or on the side of a large house uh, for typically an elderly parent. They tend to have one bed, one bath, living room, and a kitchen. Uh, this is uh, very often a, a family compromise. So instead of the parent moving inside the home or moving to retirement housing, this is a way for uh, the parent to maintain some independent living while still being close to a support network of family. Very close. Most of these are built with uh, ADA amenities in order to assist the parent. So the hand railings and the remote monitoring, so on and so forth. Um, currently, Coppell has three of these approved, but limitations were placed on the kitchens. The concern would be that in the future, these would simply just be separate, very small houses. Uh, so without kitchens, they're, they're less usable for that sort of use. Uh, next slide. Finally, we have uh, examples of group homes and house sharings. So with a group home, a, a corporation can purchase a residence, modify it, uh, and then uh, obtain a license to operate it as a group home. Uh, there's three types of group home licenses that are available depending on the level of care that's provided in the home. And we do have uh, one of these in Coppell as well. As well. Uh, group homes typically would have six to 10 residents and two caregivers during the day and one caregiver on the overnight shift. Uh, next slide, please. House sharing is a different concept. This is a concept where a homeowner would invite, say, a family member or a friend or another older adult uh, to share to share their living arrangements, uh, share the, the expenses of, of keeping up a household, share the chores, and, and to support each other. This is essentially peers re residing together for companionship and also for uh, cost efficiency. Uh, the good news here is if, as long as residents follow existing city ordinances, there's typically no ex extra regulations regarding house share. This is essentially uh, finding a roommate to help you uh, to help you as you as you age and uh, help help keep you living independently as long as possible. Uh, next slide, please. So it's worth noting that um, developers are doing a lot of outside the box things in regards to senior housing. Uh, it's being done in a lot of different places. So the question becomes, uh, are those things a fit for Coppell? And in Coppell, we have some issues here. First are uh, land deficiencies. Not that our land is bad, it's just we don't have very much of it. Uh, and because we don't have much of it, those land costs tend to be pretty high. Um, also, when you add in the cost of improvements, uh, you really get to the point where um, it's hard for many developers to see how they could then charge a market rental rate on the property and still make their required rates of return. Um, there is also in many cities a, a city role uh, to incentivize senior housing solutions and whether that involves ownership or, uh, or rental. But our findings thus far, as far as what other lo localities are doing, that indicates the cities can have a very direct participation in senior housing and how it's implemented in their community. Uh, very often, this isn't just gonna happen on its own. Uh, cities need to take an active role 
in, in making some of these solutions happen. Uh, next slide, please. So remember our pillar considerations from the Vision 2040 plan, uh, explore retrofit and refurbishment of older housing stock, establish programs to protect the unique character of single family home community OASIS nodes, explore new options for 55 plus or aging in place that maintain high standards of living while reducing footprint and also undertake studies to consider optimal future city population. So these are all considerations we've had swirling around our, our heads as we've been working on uh, on the senior portion of uh, of the of the housing pillars, but at the same time, you know, we're also considering that this is just a piece of a much larger uh, of a much larger issue. Uh, next slide, please. So, what we've been discussing in our in our board, as far as where do we go from here? One is uh, uh, engaging future IQ. Uh, this will help us. Uh, we think this is where we're gonna get the biggest bang for our buck and where we have an opportunity to uh, really take a look at not only uh, senior housing, but also uh, all the other different housing types that are available uh, in, the, in the region and that could be implemented in the city of Coppell. Uh, help us uh, whittle down those options to what works in Coppell, help, help us get those in front of focus groups to see, uh, see what members of the community think and get their input. Uh, we also want to um, make sure that when we're considering things that we are spending our time on what is possible given the current financial climate. And we know the, the city, like many other cities, uh, it, you know, is having issues with uh, sales tax revenue. So we wanna make sure we're not just pie in the sky and thinking that we, you know, the city has uh, unlimited ability to do things when in fact we know that's, that's not the case. We also want to introduce the council to some ideas in the near future uh, for things that could be done uh, in the very short term and, and ramped up uh, relatively quickly. There's some ideas that, again, some of these short term ideas that we think are, are very interesting and worth, uh, worth pursuing. And next slide, please. So it's also, uh, when it comes to not only senior housing, but the other housing types as well, uh, it's worth noting that uh, in many in many municipalities, the city acts as a, a business partner with developers. So it's it's something that will need to be explored is the ability of the city to to work with developers on projects like that as well. You know, a lot of senior housing is city bond funded. Uh, a lot of different types of projects involve the ability to get tax abatements or tax incentives. So it's it's important to know. Uh, where the city stands on those issues and uh, what can be expected uh, going forward. Next slide, please. We also want to get input on financials for seniors. Um, there are federally subsidized solutions for seniors out there. Um, there are also cities that are, have engaged in partnerships that involve rent subsidies based on income. Uh, seniors, more than any, uh, more than almost any segment of our population are people that uh, uh, frequently, uh, you know, have to live on a fixed income. And um, so noting that that income is a, a key limiting factor for many uh, seniors in their housing choices is very important. Uh, we also have to, at some point, define the financial structure that's available for housing and housing programs, both senior and non-senior, and really to understand what the city can and can't support. Again, this is, much further down the road, this is gonna involve us learning a lot more about housing types, how they fit into Coppell and what our local residents think about that. Next slide, please. Okay, I think that's our last slide. That is the is last that... slide so that you can ask for questions from the council. Fantastic, okay. I'm, I'm, I know I went more than 10 minutes on that. Uh, just when I see something, Boy, especially when it's something I might cover in class, I just start talking and talking. That's a problem. Like, let me tell you about co-ops. Oh boy. Um, okay, so uh, input, ideas. Yeah, I have a suggestion to frame um, to frame the discussion, and I think some of the members that um, came in. Um, in the second cohort of members of the Ford, uh, they they were confused why we were doing 
55 plus first. Mm -hmm. So I would put the slide that um, kind of contextualizes what, what we were chartered to do and then say we're zooming in on 55 and plus because this, this is what we were chartered to do. And you can quote the mayor when she came to, when, when she came to, um, to our first meeting. And so they told us to do priority on that. I think it was just verbally, but I think it's mm -hmm. important to right out the gate, say this is this Ford group has to look at all of these, but we're going to be focusing on this because the mandate was to focus on this. It was on the first slide, Maria, um, but I can make it more bolder on the first slide. If you want to say that the mayor came in in January, um, it is on the first slide that says that the city council, we started meeting in January and directed by the city council to focus in year one on 55 plus housing. I can add the word mayor if you want. So directed by the mayor yeah, and would, city council. It maybe, maybe it's the... Uh... Maybe the slide that shows all of it's the just pillars. A, a thing of animation. Sooner. All of the pillars. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was thinking. Moving it, fo moving it forward in the presentation, and then just say we're going to focus on this because it's kind of like at the end you say, "Well, we were thinking about these. We were thinking of all of these." I mean, I think it's easier just move it forward. Okay. But it's, so it's want, a suggestion. So you want slide nineteen to be like one of the first slides. Yeah. And then Bart, from that, you'll go into the actual first slide that we have now saying that we started meeting in 2020 and that the mayor and city council asked us to focus on 55 plus, right? Perfect. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Yeah. If we have a picture of something of that meeting or... I'm moving it right now. Like that, oh. that you can put a visual. I, okay. I have a suggestion as well on that same slide, not uh, the slide number one that we have. Uh, can you bring up that slide, please? Yeah, this one, this one, actually the next slide, yes. Yeah, so I, I think here, uh, when we are leading the discussion, I look at that bullet there saying vast research of current demographics. And we say that 25% of population is 55 plus. That is very relevant because that is uh, that is what we are going to focus on. The next one, for example, uh, we are just listing that as another statistic that we have uh, obtained from the research that so many properties have 65 plus tax exemption, exceptions. Uh, personally, uh, the way I am looking at this is our conjecture at this point is that people like to age in place in Coppell. And we have 85, 18% of 65 plus availing of these tax exceptions. And we know that they are here because we looked at the heat map of all the people where they are at, which is at the next slide. And we have seen significant number of people, uh, 65 plus are in Coppell. So clearly there is a case to be made for aging in place. And then we are trying to ask the question, what do we provide to the 55 plus demographic so that they continue to be in the city and thereabouts? Otherwise, the two pieces of information are just two distinct pieces of information. I'm just trying to connect the two. Good point. If I could add a comment about the journey slide as well. Um, is it helpful to add that there's been two Ford versions, uh, committee versions. So the first Ford task force, and now I'm part of the second iteration, but would it be helpful to them to know that we've crossed into a new group of folks? Uh, I, I, I know that. Go ahead, Mark. But I was just thinking, I, I, since the council made the appointments, I would assume they, they know that to some degree, but we could, yeah. Yeah, for one thing, the, the Ford board has not actually changed its overall reason for being or its overall um, uh, reason for creation. 
just because it's like all the other boards, Parks and Commission, you know, uh, Parks and Recreation or um, uh, Planning and Zoning, the board, the board has a certain function and it doesn't change just because the members change. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've always had the four pillars as our, as our distinction of that's what we have to work on when the board was formed. It's just that the mayor and city council felt that the first starting out of the gate, they wanted us to work on the 55 plus housing pillar. That was their uh, request of us. So we made that as the focus, but new people bring in new ideas and new perspectives, but the board itself by, by design and, and by why the city council chose to create it stays exactly the same. Okay. Subu, I, I see your hand up, your virtual hand. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm sorry I joined late, but uh, great work. Um, but I want to go on a real deep journey here and ask a fundamental question. The whole uh, presentation was excellent, awesome. But if you ask me, it looks like, um, you know, we are uh, representing a marketing firm and doing a lot of research for the board or the city of Kapel and giving them this information based on uh, market statistics and all that, demographics and all that. Of course, there is some things in the uh, slide deck that I would really change. For example, right in this slide deck, in this slide, second bullet, it talks about 19, 10 properties out of 10, 580 have 65 plus tax exceptions. I think that should be exemptions if I'm correct. Right. But anyway, anyway, without without going into uh, you know too much. Uh, fine tooth combing off my internal auditor hat. I have a fundamental question. What is our charge? I know that I keep hearing the board wanted us to do this, board wanted us to do this. That is all fine. We don't work for the board. We are not employed by the board. The board has picked us, you know, I don't have an oath. You know, Mindy sent an email saying, you know, you guys don't have an oath. That's fine. I don't have an oath. But at the end of the day, you know, what is our charge? Our charge is we represent the citizens of Kapel. We are a citizen of Kapel. We are all citizens of Kapel. So as a citizen of Kapel, what do they want? Do they, does everybody sign up to Vision 2040? I'm not sure, you know. So, so if you're say, telling me that the board asks us to do this, the board asks us to do this, that seems like, uh, you know, we are just... Uh, uh, you know, uh, no, that's not what we, we are trying to do. We are trying to create the next future, uh, you know, uh, home uh, for the retirement people. They want to live here. With that being said, uh, I think that's what we should do rather than keep on saying this is what the board wants us to do. The board, the board wants us to do, that's fine. They can hire a high AQ or high YQ and all that if they have the money, which I don't believe they have based on the tax situation that they have and everything that's going to come down the pike in 2022. So I, I would highly recommend financial prudence. I would not, even though I don't have an oath, when this presentation goes to the committee, uh, when this uh, oath goes to the, uh, when this presentation goes to the council, I'm going to say I'm not supporting this one way or the other with, uh, you know, taking this money and spending with the high IQ. No, sir, not one dollar. Because if we have done all this research, we don't need anybody else. You know, we don't need anybody else. They can do better research than them that we are proving that. You know, every day we are proving we are doing better research than whoever is doing that. If, if we have to pay even $1 to somebody to do research, that's a waste of couple taxpayer money. Let me say, say that one more time. Okay, that's a big drain on that. With that being said, I think we are not doing justice to what the couple citizens have asked and what we have not got the voice of the customer. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Subu. Uh, Vaughn, I see your, your hand, virtual and real. Okay. Um, yes, I just wanted a couple of things as Subu was speaking as well. Um, something that hit me, and I'm a numbers person, so I'm always looking for how and what the story is. So I think I would shy away from vast research because we, it's all subject to interpretation and it's really not vast. We're not a research entity, we're citizens. Maybe um, just current demographics. I would just, yes. And I would state the 
point in time. And then when you're going to give approximations, 25% of the population, you should give that number because what did you base that on? It's got to be concrete and factual. So what is that number? What does that represent? Because if we did nothing at all, that would be the at-risk population, right? The 55 plus. So the world should know what that number is. Then that secondly, number, you mean you want the actual number? Of yes. Versus yes. Home? Because okay. I you have look that. at the data point at a point in time and it's subject to change. So by sitting here for a year, if we looked at it in January and now we're looking at it two years later, there's a shift. What is that shift? Is it positive or negative? What is the overall effect of doing absolutely nothing? That would be one of the things that we would present, right? Then when you look at the properties themselves that are receiving the tax exemption, I believe there was some compelling evidence that was discussed at that point that said, there's not a process where you're reaching out. So you don't even know that all of that population is taking advantage of the exemption. Because we talked about that. No, they are taking advantage of it because that's how we have, that's how we know about them. They have filed with the county stating that they are 65. You file an exemption with the county. And then yes. the county goes and tells the cities and the um, school boards that that your property value will be subject to exemption rates. So what was the compelling evidence? Cause I know it was presented that said that that exemption didn't carry forth. Something had to happen in order for it to be qualified. What do you and mean it doesn't carry forth? I'm not understanding. It's in our notes somewhere. It's in the minutes we recorded that session. So it should be in there. It's, it was something to the effect Could that I can I tune in real quick, Yvonne? Yes. So the exemptions that they have right here, that we do have recorded doc, I mean, we have documentation that this many properties do have the exemption. What we, it, it is filed by the individual and it is based on age. There you what go. Talking about what y'all were talking about was if you could get an exemption for improvements that were made to the home and because they were kind of the aging in place exemptions and you were asking if they could stay with the property, even if that individual moved. And I, I said at that time, I didn't know that an exemption could stay with a property right. they, based on the ownership. Okay, today. so in truth, since we're not an entity that researches that, do we know when someone turns 65 and does not take advantage of the exemption? No. That was what I was talking they, about. They the would evidence. have to file with the county. Yeah. Yep. That's what I was talking about was the evidence. So when we talked about doing a good service to the citizens, we talked about some sort of a campaign that would be helpful because we're talking about helping the citizens as aging that would remind them a checklist, right? Of things that they might want to do to best leverage their resources. And one of them would be to file the exemption, right? in the year that they were meeting this. So that's all I wanted to call to the intention was, was empirical evidence. Evidence is really important because otherwise it's just us pulling things out of the air. Um, we need to back these things with facts for the citizens so that they understand. Um, and then on the neighborhoods, when we are specific in talking about the neighborhoods that are aging in place, I would really um, showcase those because you can tie that to this 55 plus and this 18%. And I think that's important because that might streamline any focus that goes there as it relates to the other initiatives we were looking at. Do you think we need something stronger than the next map? The next page is the map, which actually shows that. Um, I think, think yes, yeah, something stronger than this. I think the visual is good, but I don't necessarily think people will immediately correlate that, right? So when we're talking about um, the addition, this is, of this is the actual exemption at at each HOA or home 
uh, area level. Subdivision, yeah. Subdivision level. So maybe it would be nice if we listed the subdivisions or the HOAs as our constituents, right? They're there right in front of you. Well, I don't They're see They're listed it. on the map. Because I'm looking at mine, I'm looking at my subdivision because so I'm, I'm a 10 to 20. Yeah, percent. I would look for, for maybe then um, calling it out. Maybe if you ran your, where you can actually see it. Because the truth is I didn't see it. I don't see it. I see red. That's what I'm looking at. Um, but I don't see that or what, how it correlates to the data is the best way to put it. I had the same thought. I thought this slide had a lot of power, yep. but I don't know where to look. And so exactly. I think, and I think our audience, because they need, as was said at the beginning of this meeting, they need to know what we've looked into so far before we make recommendations. This is a powerful slide. It's, it really says a lot. So we need to kind of give them more direction on what to focus on. So I, as you were going through this, which was excellent, I made up my own mind. I'm going to focus on the reds and the oranges. There you go. Right there. Um, exactly. You know what I mean? So Bart, you want me to, um, I can put some animation on this slide to where we, we have some circles that come up on the red and oranges and you'll just know to talk about that. And then the yeah, uh, and I can, I can probably learn ahead of time the name of a few of the subdivisions that are, that are red I'll and be sure and point them out. When they come up, I'll actually put them, I'll put the names up in the larger font so that you okay. can actually call them out. Or, right. or they can uh, they can see on the slide then what the name of the subdivisions are that are red. So you could potentially take expand? the you could Sorry, potentially okay. take the bullet from the last slide, the last slide, and add it back on here just for the continuity because uh, the previous slide that you had, yeah, this last piece here uh, on the current demographics, and then we continue on. So these two are essentially correlated very heavily with what is coming next. Mm -hmm. So just to facilitate uh, his story, the way he wants to go about it, uh, maybe we need to just call, call out to this again at the next slide. So how we make it, uh, whether you want to do it as an animation, I don't know. <laughs> um, Bart, would it be easier for you to What I'm thinking is, is that the verbiage is on the slide previous to this, and then you would say, so let me show you this in an example, and then the map would be big. It wouldn't have any verbiage on the map other than the legend, and then it would have the, the red pop out. So in other words, all your verbiage would be on the first slide, and then you say, let, let me show you this, and then, you know, and then you'd have the map, because you don't want the map too much smaller and if I put more verbiage on this slide then the map becomes too small. Right. So I'd rather have the map exactly. big, all yeah. the verbiage on that first slide, then the map is big, which makes then the the neighborhoods bigger and then I'll have some animation where the neighborhoods can can be popped out with their names on it so that you can definitely, you know, use some of their names. Perfect. Can I ask, do you want them to focus on a certain color other than red? Yeah, red and orange, because yeah. those are the populations that are getting older. Exactly. So, I mean, you, 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 could, you could start with the yellow and green and then end with, I mean, or take, take colors away. I mean, yes. Or if, the, if it is possible to, I don't know how, how it would be, but if you know that there are large pockets of 55 plus individuals here uh, then the next level map would be those people and you want them to age in place or they want to consider aging in place here there's so no they're currently way aging in place there's no way to find out who's 55 living yeah in the house. that's what i thought so yeah, that would be yeah yeah we thought about that and we tried to figure out a way to to figure that but there's no way to know the age of a homeowner um, other than if they're 65 and they've applied for the 
uh, exam. True, true. Yeah, that's what I felt like that would be a difficult number to get to. Yeah, but like we could get to the 55 plus for the overall number based on 2019 um, population and the population breakdown here I in see. the in Coppell. Yeah, but not where they live. No, no. I like the idea of taking colors away because that'll help kind of tell your story and it's visual and people will connect it out a lot faster. I really like that idea. That was okay, just so shared. Matt, are you on I the call? I don't know if it's possible. Well, I'm asking, Matt, are you on the call? Yes, ma'am. Hey, so can you and I work on an overlay where we take this map and then we create a secondary map where everything disappears except for the red and the orange and the orange and then i can i can take that and actually overlay it, it yeah yeah i think i think we can do that um one thing i wanted to point out was the red is you know it might be slightly over 30 percent so you know you're, you're not looking at 30 to 50 percent or something like that and some of the some of the red are smaller neighborhoods like on the far east of the city you see that little little subdivision trinity shores that's probably got 15 houses right so uh you know if you get questioned about it just just know that some of some of the the data might be skewed because it's a percentage and, and if you have a small sample you it might show up as a red category, right? Fair enough. Uh, but but yeah, definitely we can we can uh, work to peel away some of the the green and the yellow. I think the orange and, and the red are probably the most significant. Yeah, so I'll work with you on that, so we can I can get a slide to animate and and. Yeah, 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 and once once we do that, we might be able to label the uh, the subdivisions that are red and orange, you know, with uh, like little call outs. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. Um, I was gonna kind of take and and zoom in and then and then push those out into little little squares or whatever and and call out their names. But yeah, you and I can work on that. We can. For sure, yeah. So Bart, this this slide will be the maps and it'll have some animation to it and stuff. And when we get that all put together and I send it to you, then I'll give you a call so we can talk about the different clicks that you'll have to do to get there. <laughs> Perfect. Get my click technique uh, up to speed. That's right. <laughs> all right. Uh, yes, super. So again, I agree with most of the comments on this slide. It's definitely misleading. It's not valuable because it doesn't uh, give a big picture because it shows like uh, the everywhere in couple, uh, somebody's aging uh, 65 plus. So and then even the title which says neighborhood where citizens are definitely aging in place based on 65 plus county exemption. Uh, Aging in place, what does it mean? Uh, does it mean that I've lived in Apple for one year, two years, five years at 65 plus, or 10 years? What does aging in place mean? Maybe we need to uh, calibrate ourselves. If I moved here, uh, you know, last year, I'm 65 plus, I bought the home. Uh, does it mean I'm aging in place? Or if I'm living here from 55 and today I'm 65, 66, uh, am I aging in place? So that's a question. Um, uh, that needs to be answered, I think. And this looks like everybody is aging across Coppell, which is not true, right? It's just 25% of Coppell residents are even eligible or, or claiming exemption. So this slide is totally misleading, gentlemen. Now, 25% of the city, uh, we got to be clear on this, 25% of the city is 55 plus. They can be 55 to 100, let's say. <laughs> so... Uh, 25% of the city is 55 to 100 years old. Only those people who are 65 to 100 years old can, a, can apply for a 
an actual legal exemption on their property with the county and um and then and then they get uh elderly you know perks um because they're over 65. so these this red neighborhoods there are house is based on a percentage of housing in the neighborhood so if i have 202 homes in my neighborhood which i do and i am a yellow right now because i'm looking at that so basically 10 to 20 percent of the houses in my neighborhood are owned by people 65 and older that have the exemption so okay that's a problem that's it, it is, is it 10 or is it 20 because 10 to 20 percent is a big range and if it's just 25 percent of total couple residents that are even between 55 or 100 or even 120 which is where i think the last time i checked the uh, people are living i guess but this looks like a whole lot of color somebody threw a whole lot of color on this so what are we i i, I can go back to somebody's question what are we trying to focus on and what does greater than 30 percent mean greater than 30 percent can mean 100 percent it can mean 99 percent we are not giving information that is act actionable this is not actionable information ladies and gentlemen and even the colors of this map are red why you end the colors you know the lines are red what is the big deal who did this was this done by some developer i don't even know that because the, the whole lines are red and this is bleeding red with red inside I'm sorry, I'm being very critical. This was that's what designed by the, this was asked for by me to the city because the city has the county rolls on it and they have the county, uh, they have the county database and the county database would tell us per, uh, per area, per neighborhood, how many of those homes are 65 plus homes. Matt, you, you can... I didn't mean to step out on you. Oh. Yeah, well, well, Subu, this is a, it's a conceptual map, just giving us, uh, it's it's called a, um, I, I don't know exactly how to how to term it, but it's it's giving us a focus. So we can focus on these neighborhoods. The, the red and the orange is kind of a gradient map, like what they use for uh, weather, that sort of thing. And so it's common, commonly used in GIS to narrow down your focus uh, to certain neighborhoods. So, um, yeah, I, I think once we once we take take off some of the colors, we could we could change the orange and the red, and make that less in your face. Um, so, but but really, it's just just saying, hey, we're we're trying to focus on these neighborhoods because they have a greater percentage of over 65 uh, tax exempt properties. And so that gives us a starting point, really. Um, Matt, let me ask you something, and I don't know if this is even possible, but on these, um, these percentages, so like for example, I live in Pecan Hollow. So Pecan Hollow has 202 homes you know that, right? Because that's how you got the percentage of 10 to 20%. So you would know the amount of homes in that neighborhood over the amount of homes that have a 65 plus exemption, right? Right, yeah, that's how we that's how we calculated the percentage. Okay, and so, so there's, you know, there's data behind each of these uh, layers. So maybe we could figure out a way to graphically display that data so that in the small little squares of like um, Trinity Shores there, you can say 10 houses, you know, and right. two of them are, you know, 10 houses and, you know, right. four are that. Right, and, and you know, I mean, we, we, this, is a, this is a snapshot, you know, I mean, it's just, a, just an image, a concept of, of what we're looking at. So. I don't know for this presentation if we need to get into that level of detail, but just maybe have it in our back pocket in case, you know, they say, go back to that slide, you know, I mean, and they start calling us out on some of that stuff, then we might be able to just have, say, yeah, well, we acknowledge, you know, there's only 20 houses in the subdivision, but the majority of the houses are 
you know, over 30%. So we had to include it. Um, right. But, but yeah, it, any, any data that you guys want from this map, I can probably get. It might take some time. Um, Bart, let me ask you something. If, if Matt and I get together and we try to go over the actual numbers on, on just the red and maybe the orange places there where we say the number of houses over how many are have a 65 uh, number of houses with 65 exemption, um, maybe we can have a table like that, but just limiting it to the high population densities and then um and then that way you know it it would present itself you know and, and maybe we not we don't include that in the powerpoint necessarily but we could give that a supplemental material to council just in case they're interested we could yeah in fact i could make a sheet where we have the little map of whatever matt and i come up with and then that table um Matt, I, I, I'd be willing to type up that table with the, with the stats of the number in the ha in that subdivision, and then the. Uh, in fact, I, I think I have a table similar to that as far as the number of houses in each subdivision because I'm on a because I'm an HOA person. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We, All right, we, Maria. I see you with your your hand up. Yes, I have my hand up. I mean, this is a GIS image that what it means is that you put different layers of information. This, I mean, this is an image of the reality we have in, in Capel. I, I think we're just making a huge deal on this. I think if we just, when, when we talk about the maps, just say we ask the city to pull a map that puts this information together, the amount of houses that have the exemption, and then there was an index that we estimated, which was the percentage of homes that had people over 65. The important data on this are the, as you see, there's red and there's orange. This is where the there are more houses that have people that are 65 and over. So we could say that there's a trend in these areas of people that are over 65 are located there. Just leave it like that. I mean, and, and, and please, I mean, if we want to put, I mean, this is not a research firm. We are not academics. Um, we are just a bunch of citizens looking at data and presenting it to the, to, if, if there's more details they need, yes, we can have the tables, we can have all that. But I think it's 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 a very good map to show, um, you know, the trend. Um, and 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 I understand my our new colleague. He's being very skeptical, and being the ad the advocates the devil's advocate in in crushing the presentation. But it's it it is just a GIS. It's a geographic information system image that gives us some information it's like the thermometer the per, the doctor puts in your mouth and measures the temperature it's not telling you what your sickness is it's just telling you that you have 90 degree temperature so i i think we're fussing way too much over one graph i like the graph but i think it just needs to be explained just focus on the orange and red those are the areas where there's more Households that have a, an exemption, so it means that somebody over sixty-five is living there. Yeah, and, you know, to add to Maria's point, because um, we also looked at all these different maps. I mean, we looked at one-story houses versus two-story. Did we see that there was more sixty-five exemptions for one stories versus two? So, I mean, we looked at all sorts of different, um, you know, aging in place criteria, tidbits, whatever, and, um, you know, to, to, to see if we saw any type of patterns or anything. And then, and then we looked at data that, you know, that just to see where we were as a city. Okay. Well, these have been a lot of very good suggestions and comments. Uh, in the interest of not keeping everyone here all night, and because we do still have another item on the agenda, 
uh, kind of a last call for comments on the presentation. Just any anything else that maybe didn't seem to uh, to flow or tie together. And I've I've been making notes as we've been going along. So, um, you know, the question of we have the increasing a increasingly aging population. What services can should we be providing that helps links the facts and the ideas early on? What are the consequences of doing nothing? I think is a, a good a good question. A, you know, good way of phrasing that. Uh, the idea of having like a senior checklist uh, with, that includes things like filing for a tax exemption, I think is a nice, uh, nice idea. And also just basically when I mentioned aging in place, that, that point is extremely well taken of defining like it does. I don't think that means that you buy a place and you're 65 and you live in it for six months. That's not aging in place. So uh, actually being able to provide a definition of that, you know, it's in the 2040 plan, but, you know, at the same time, we want to all make sure we're, we're talking about the same thing. So that's, that's great. It's something with some nuance. Absolutely. Uh, any other, any other points to, to be taken on this before uh, Peggy and I talk a little bit about the webinar we attended? Bart, remind me, did you at the beginning of the presentation, um, give a call to action, telling them what you're about to tell them, and then telling them what you want them to focus on? Is it just that they I, listen to the work or that they be prepared for our second meeting where we make recommendations? Whatever. Yeah, that's a good I, point. I might have missed it and I might have forgotten. Yeah. My daughter's in the background. I'm doing a lot of things. So I just want to make yeah. sure the audience is clear on why we're telling them what we're telling them and what their role is mm -hmm. afterward or before. Just a question. Yeah, we, we, we definitely set up initially that the goal is to give them an update on what we've been working on. Then we give them that update. But then at the end, we start in with a, a wish list or, you know, things that we're going to be focusing on going forward. But that includes the wish list of engaging future IQ, for example. Um, so yeah, we might need to add a, as we get to the end, Peggy, it might help to add an, a header or something to kind of tie that last that last section together. Well, I thought that it was there because the header is about doing a, a session with the council. It says, where do okay. we go from here? Yeah. S okay. Council work session on pillars considerations, and then those are all the considerations. And maybe, um, so so maybe when we go back through those slides, if you want it stronger, I can change it to anything that you feel is stronger. But it does say where we go from here. Council mm -hmm. work session on pillar considerations. Okay, so that'll I think part of that is just going to be me putting more focus on what's what's already there. Uh, so, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, get all these changes and change the verbiage and um, change the other things, get it, um, and then work with Matt on a couple different things we can do with the map, and then uh, get it back over to you, and uh, then we can talk about it and and see if, if I missed anything. You guys did a great so, job. So appreciated. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, you guys have done a great job and it's the work of all of you that um, makes up the, the imp I mean, the content of the presentation. So thank you to everybody for all the work. I will encourage you to just to try to shorten it a little bit because you'll lose I know. if, if yeah. you go too long. So really hitting the high points of mm -hmm. each point you're trying to make is is going to be a good thing for you. Yeah. Just you keep their attention and focused on the things. But, really but by my third or fourth run through, I should be having it on a pretty good, pretty good clip. Uh, yeah, that's yes. Yeah, I wanted I, I wanted to also add, um, uh, Mindy, should we give them the slides beforehand? Or what I mean, what is what is the best protocol? We don't typically provide the slides in advance, but if you do have a handout of if, maybe a handout might be good. We we definitely can submit that as backup as part of the agenda item. Um, and so if if y'all have produced one or you want to produce one um, and get it over to me prior to the agenda posting, that that would be great. So um, so with that being said, I just want to confirm. Are you? good with april 27th then or okay let me double check but yeah i assume i am uh, okay i, I would hate wait it's like wait a second let me see april 22nd yes 27th yeah yes 27th sorry no yeah yes yeah that okay. morning is the dallas senior housing summit and the rest of the day is open so perfect yeah th so, my question is we then we present to a council that still doesn't have the 
new members just as an information and then we'd present to the you know to the new council once they're elected is that what the strategy that's question kind of up for y'all to decide because um we have the potential we have one seat where there are three candidates so there's the potential for a runoff for that one um the majority of the council should be seated and and sworn in by May 11th, I believe is the date. And if there is a runoff, then it's just the one seat they think that has three people running. Um, that runoff election would not be until June. I can't remember the, I think it's, early, I mean, it's like the first available date in June. So, so it's really y'all's call on whether you wanna go ahead and spend the time to present this, um, knowing that you might have a change to council or if um or if you want to wait till the new council is seated that's that's really y'all's decision on what you want to do i mean i will say one of our if one of our future to do's is to have a work session with the council that would be with the new council so they'd see this Correct. information again at that point right and we're kind of laying the groundwork to having the work session with that was the whole purpose here tell them what we worked on and say here's here's what you know what we're pointing to um we need a work session and here's what we'd like to discuss at the work session because that's in there. Okay. If, if, so if it sounds like y'all are okay, then I will put you on the agenda for April 27th. I'll confirm that. So. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, agenda item number five is discussion of the affordable housing webinar by Bart McElroy and Peggy Quinn. Um, so this was a, a BizNow event. They have a lot of different industry uh, webinars available, and uh, I'm on their mailing list. So when I saw this, uh, forwarded this to, to Mindy and Peggy. And actually, I was pleasantly surprised because they charge for most of their webinars, but they did not charge anything for the affordable housing webinar, which I thought was a classy move. Uh, that would have been really bad if they did. Um, I mean, I have thoughts, but Peggy, did, did you want to give some some thoughts on anything interesting that you learned? Uh, um. Well, I, I basically just, I didn't really take very many notes. I just, I sat there and listened to them about affordable housing and about some of the things that they're doing. Most of them though, um, involve really bigger cities. I did notice that. I mean, nobody said anything that was going on in a small city. Um, you know, you're talking, you know, Arlington, Fort Worth. There was one guy there who talked about different things happening in Fort Worth. And stuff so there was not a lot to compare to what is available here versus what's available in in some of the larger places and everything um and i didn't so i didn't really take all that many notes on it so you probably have more notes Bart. i'm going to turn that back over mm, to you fine. Then yeah we're going to another one on the 24th 27th 27th yeah oh wow yeah so so some in, some interesting things uh, I got out of the webinar. One was uh, a lot of times when you talk about affordable housing uh, and when these developers talk to cities about developing affordable housing, you know, they'll, they'll tell the cities, well, our numbers say that, for example, you are short 20,000 housing units, you know, the number of people that work in your city but have to commute in. And, you know, you need to build more affordable housing. These are usually people in lower income brackets. And a frequent response from city, especially elected officials is, no, we have plenty of that. But he said, what, what city officials are typically thinking of are low end apartments and bad quality rental housing. That's what they think of when they think of affordable housing. So one term they were using that uh, I think is a great analog to that is to say workforce housing, you know, because you're saying these are people who are working in your community, should they be able to afford to live there as well? Um, but yeah, the, the issue with the um, uh, elected officials, you know, having a typical initial, initial bad reaction to uh, the idea of having affordable housing, uh, it's something I, we've all heard of NIMBY and NIMBYism, right? Not in my backyard, but uh, that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, any, any time you're talking about anything besides, you know, single family residential in the, you know, 300,000 plus or whatever, whatever price range you want to put it, you're going to get people who think, well, I don't want that here, you know, uh, and what that is will depend on the neighborhood. But uh, 
you know, it, it is it is natural to expect that sort of pushback and uh, that the idea then is to actually show the things, you know, so one developer is talking about, no, we're not talking about building bad apartments or low quality rental housing. Uh, what we're talking about is building, you know, good apartments or high quality rental housing. And a lot of times this is even low density uh, workforce housing. But when you start building high quality things that are affordable, what you start doing is forcing the people who own the low quality housing to step up their game and improve their properties. Cause otherwise they're not going to have any, uh, any tenants or at least any tenants at the rate they want to rent the property on it. So that can actually have a cascading effect in a neighborhood with, uh, uh, or an area with, you know, low quality housing in it. Um, related to this, um, I was reading about the, the Plano mayoral race and, uh, the idea of housing density, workforce housing, that's that's all coming in, you know, mixed use developments. That's all coming into play there too, with a couple of the candidates being firmly in favor of like, no, we want the, the low density single family houses with the yards. And just one candidate is saying, you know, we already have a number of these mixed use things and Plano is really becoming more of an urban area than a suburban area. So we should consider continuing to do this sort of thing. Um, yeah, my, my my big takeaways from the webinar were the uh, uh, even if a lot of these projects aren't necessarily applicable to Capel, uh, it's still um, the idea that you know even if you know we're doing research and we think something is great, uh, you know don't don't be surprised if there's pushback just because something's different, and um, also the the language around you know and the affordable moniker honestly that that applies to senior housing. As well, so that's something we need to be aware of too when we're talking about senior housing, because you know, again, the seniors famously on a you know frequently on a fixed income. So uh, the idea of affordable as low quality, that's an idea that continues to need to be uh, to be challenged. Those were my major takeaways from the uh, from the webinar. Peggy's right; a lot of the projects they were talking about were in bigger cities, but. Uh, so I think we can we can learn some things. Did you have anything else, Peggy? No, just that we're going to another one of those. Um, yep. Later on this month, and we might learn more. Uh, hopefully, you know, it's <laughs> what, like three hours long. I hope we learned something. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's a really long one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that was agenda item number five. Agenda item number six is new business. Uh, is there any new business to be brought before the board? Yeah. Just yeah. To, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Did somebody else have something? I didn't mean to. Okay. Um, just wanted to get your thoughts on what y'all would like to see at the May meeting. I will definitely recap the council presentation. Um, council meetings are still hybrid. So um, there are people in, on on site and then there's also virtual. So um, if if any of you want to attend virtually, just let me know so we can get you a link. Um, otherwise, you're welcome to come on site and, and be there present if, if you're interested. But we'll definitely recap the presentation. Um, is there anything else y'all would like to see on the main meeting? Ms. Hart, are you going to the meeting or are you presenting online? Uh, honestly, I hadn't, I hadn't, I don't know. Um, I think my druthers would be online, but uh, Mindy, if you think there's some sort of benefit to me doing it in person, then I can I can swing that as well. Um, it, I, we can we can discuss which whichever is best for you, honestly. So, okay, you know, I, I got the vaccine. I'm not too scared of getting out in public. Yeah. Does anybody right. else have anything specific on the May for the May meeting that they'd like to have covered? I did let Mindy know there's a there's that concept in housing uh, as we as we start getting into sorry I have a very excited pet here um, there's a concept in housing that I as we get into a larger discussion of, of housing outside of just the realm of senior housing uh, there's a concept that's referred to as the the missing middle which is there's not really much between a detached single family house and like an apartment complex and there's um, there's some academics and other folks that are working on that so I'm I volunteered. To Mindy to try and find a speaker along those lines. 
Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be for me, but uh, I've, I've found a few folks that I'm, I'm going to start reaching out to. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Okay. If there's nothing else, then that was, I just wanted to make sure we covered everything y'all wanted to cover in, at the May meeting. So. Okay, perfect. Well, uh, since we have no business and we are at the end of our agenda, we will move on to agenda item number seven, and that means we are adjourned. So thanks, everyone. See you next month. Thanks, Barb. Thank you all. Yeah.